Rudy Navari, Indiana University. This is for Michael. Um, I really liked your talk and your, your intervention. I had a couple questions. One is, it seemed like in your study, you had to uh, get or talk to 2,000 patients in order to get 200 in your study. That was number one. I wanted to know why uh, those patients declined, um, so many declined. And then secondly, the patients who did participate, did you have any information about their knowledge or their prognosis? And did you have information on, on that? And, and maybe if they thought they had a great prognosis, then they weren't anxious or, or, or have any emotional responses. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, there were 2,000 people who were referred to the study. Uh, many of them actually weren't eligible after we looked at the entry criteria. And um, so it wasn't quite 2,000 in order to get to 200. But uh, there are a variety of reasons people declined, uh, ranging from uh, they, they were just too busy, they weren't interested, they were too sick, the family member didn't want to bring them to appointments, um, there, it was burdensome, I mean, there were all sorts of reasons. Uh, but it just sort of affirmed the challenges of, of doing this sort of thing. These were people who uh, were quite ill, and we were asking them to sit through several hours of an intervention, uh, as well as many phone calls. We, we contacted them every four to six weeks, uh, after the intervention until they die, and just many people didn't want to do that. Um, so there are a host of reasons why they didn't uh, participate. Uh, in terms of what did they know about their prognosis, we never told them their prognosis. The physicians who referred them uh, were told that the entrance criteria would be, you wouldn't be surprised if they died within the next two years. That's sort of, we loosely framed it. But the patients themselves may or may not have known that. Uh, in fact, we did a small sub-study looking at uh, patients' awareness of their diagnosis, and we compared uh, what the patient said their diagnosis was with what the doctor said their diagnosis was with what the, uh, the pathologist said their diagnosis was. And we found that uh, they agreed maybe 85% of the time. Uh, but there were, we had patients who had uh, brain tumors and we asked them, do, uh, do you have cancer? And they said, no. Uh, so there's people out there who are really unaware of their, their medical condition. Um, but most of them did, did know. Next, yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> Abe Schwab, I'm from um, Indiana and Purdue's campus in Fort Wayne. It's a question actually about the surrogate decision making. Uh, there was a strong emphasis on um, decisions that the surrogates could live with after the fact. And I guess I was a little unclear. I, I, I was hoping I would have a nice, tight articulation here. I'll try and say this as quickly as I can. Um, how, how, is the, how are we approaching this? We want the surrogates to make a decision that they can live with. Because there's a number of reasons I would be concerned about that as a primary decision-making criteria. One is it may undermine respect for patient. One is it may lead to you know, violation of non-maleficence. But then also there's concerns about the surrogate's ability to make a good judgment about what they'll be able to live with because we often overinflate how much something is going to affect us over the long term. So this leads to the question, is this actually a moral criteria we're using about what surrogates should should be using to decide how they should decide for the person they're deciding for, or is it something we're thinking of as a practical necessity in order to make circuit decision making work? And it wasn't quite clear which way you were viewing it. Okay. Um, so I guess I've been really influenced by work that's come out in the last few years about PTSD and PTSD symptoms in surrogates who've made decisions for a loved one in the ICU. And there's literature from France where they found that the incidence of PTSD symptoms six months after someone had made end-of-life decisions for someone else in an ICU, the preval I guess the incidence was about 82% of these people had PTSD symptoms. There's another study from San Francisco which found actually a diagnosis of PTSD, which was about 30% of surrogates who'd made decisions for a loved one in the ICU. In light of that, I've been thinking about what are things that we can do during the decision-making process that might affect that down the road. And I think I've seen in my palliative care work where surrogates are pushed into making a decision right now, 
and they may not have time to really think about which decision they're going to live with. And the, their loved one's going to die regardless, but they're not. And if there's something we can do to prevent further morbidity, that's sort of my take on it. But I recognize that it's a little different because, yes, our primary duty is to our patient, and yet there are a lot of patients that we can't save. And if we can't save them and they're comfortable, then I think we do need to look at what the surrogates are saying a little bit. I don't know if that answers your question. That's good. Thanks. If I could just add a little yes, bit yes, to that. Please, the other Actually, the, 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 what you're just describing about the PTSD and the burden of surrogate decision making, that's the entire focus of the new study that we're doing, is to look at whether using our intervention can help diminish the stress of surrogate decision making by helping people to be more informed about what their loved ones would want. Uh, as well as um, being more uh, confident in, in being able to make decisions. Obviously, it's not going to get rid of all the stress of having a loved one die, but at least it can help eliminate the stress that's associated with just not knowing what it is that they would want. Yes. Lydia Dugdale, Yale University. My question is for Dr. Fournier. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a pediatrician. I'm an adult medicine doctor. And I was interested in your definition of humanity in death. And particularly, I was interested in uh, the time frame that you proposed after withdrawal of fluid and, and nutrition of three to five days as being a, a humane period of time to wait uh, before sedating the, the, the baby to, to death. And I was wondering, I don't know if this is common practice um, in pediatrics, so maybe that's one question I have. But I'm also wondering, in France, if there has been a conversation between the pediatricians and the adult medicine doctors in terms of what humanity means uh, for an adult who's dying after uh, withdrawal of artificial nutrition and hydration. Thank you very much for your question. Um, humanity and inhumanity are terms that have been employed by the parents themselves and the families. So it's not our own definition. It was interesting to, to hear that they always uh, tell the same things under this, this word. Actually, we are conducting the same study in three other groups in France, in adults group, uh, that are proposed to have withdrawal of artificial nutrition and hydration too, in geriatrics, in palliative care, and in people with very heavy neurotic, neurological damage. We, didn't, we haven't finished the study yet on these three groups, but we have a feeling that it could be quite the same. And we don't know exactly, but it could be a sort of paradigmatic schema for illustrating all this for everyone which is interesting, but I can't tell you at this point. I must come back next year to tell you. Uh, hi, Eugene Bereza from McGill. Uh, the question is Dr. Fournier. Um, as you know, be probably because of the language similarities, we've had a, a small number of French-trained neonatologists practicing uh, in Quebec. Uh, in a couple of cases I've been involved in, uh, the, it seems like the neonatal community has judged those neonatologists as being very um, aggressive pro-euthanasia individuals uh, in the particular cases they've been involved in. When I speak to them, however, it's interesting, like on your slides, is not focusing on the act. In my conversations with them, they do not perceive themselves, they, they don't frame it as pro-euthanasia or pro-aggressive. They seem to be telling me that they see it as um, they come now to a culture which is where autonomy has run amok and they're trying to preserve what they think is a core responsibility for beneficent paternalism. Does that resonate at all with your experience? Yes, it's exactly what, I, what we found. I'm okay with you. Great. I, yeah, I'm Bob Taylor from the Ohio State University, and I do, I do palliative care. And uh, Lisa, I wanted to comment and maybe a question, um, but uh, regarding the question of PTSD and living with decisions, um, when I talk to patients and families in situations where the patient is probably going to be dying in the near future, uh, not necessarily immediately, and the patients are able to converse, 
One of the questions I most commonly ask is what's most important to you? And by far the most common answer is that my family's okay, that they are you know, not overly distressed by my death. Uh, so, that kind, so I guess the point I'm making is that it's not just for the families. That's a way of caring for the patients is to make sure the family's okay. Yeah, and there, there is from a bunch of different sources literature where patients have talked about burdening their loved ones and concerns about that. By saying in the older model, the French model, the, the NICU docs would, would conduct active information but without parental knowledge, in part to protect them from guilt. What was struck me about the results you showed is it seemed like what folks wanted was to make sure that the baby died, because it was a, they wanted to overcome the risk of the baby surviving, but didn't want it to look like they had killed them. Is if they die too quickly, it seems inhumane. If they survive, it seems inhumane. What, what, what would keep you, keep one from interpreting those findings is just what people want is the pretense of not killing, but they want to make sure the baby's dead. Tu me traduis vraiment précisément pour pas que je me plante oh, sur la réponse. In, in, in some way, maybe I can summarize it, is um, in fact what, what's being advocated in the middle way, a sort of still a form of slow euthanasia because the intention is still to make the baby die more quickly. Yes, that is exactly the threshold. On the first model, doctors and parents, when they are okay with that, are happy to let the baby, you know, maybe survive. But in the two other models, that means in the majority of cases, they are altogether favorable to a hand of life project and that the baby die because they consider that at this point it is his best interest. And if the best interest of the baby is to die, so we have to assume it and to really do everything to alleviate pain and put some comfort and be with good relationship, but not to let him uh, having a chance of surviving. Yeah. So it can, be, it can be called slow euthanasia, why not? Okay. Um, well, um, I want all of you to join me in thanking our uh, panel for a really excellent group of presentations. Thank you.